guess the six things that we're going to talk about before we start reading. Who is one? What is another one? Where? Why? When? And how? Those six questions are uh, being reminded because we started Deuteronomy on Sunday morning. We started Philemon last week. And ended Philemon last week. And here we are starting Hebrews. Um, and really, the, the who is actually unknown when it comes to the book of Hebrews. Um, we just know that the letter was written to the Hebrews. And most likely, it was Paul. There's a lot of reasons for that. We probably won't get into many of them, um, except for the ones that I like, <laughs> and that's the trilogy. Um, Paul wrote a trilogy, um, and it was all according to Habakkuk 2.4, uh, and I, I think we talked about this when we were in Romans, we talked about this when we were in Galatians, and now I'm going to talk about it again, because here we are in Hebrews, and I just think it's kind of fascinating. Because Habakkuk 2.4, that verse just simply says, The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4. And you, he answers the question, if the writer is Paul, he answers the question of that first, the just, who is the just, by writing the book of Romans. And then he answers how they shall live when we get to the book of Galatians. And then here in Hebrews, he's going to talk about it's by faith. And so those, those phrases, it's just pretty neat how really the book of Romans emphasizes and answers that question of justice and what it means to be just. And then Galatians is how we shall live. And then Hebrews here, we, we have, of course, the famous chapter of faith. <coughs> and the whole, the whole book of Hebrews really has a lot to say about our faith. <laughs> so, yeah, unknown, um, but in parentheses you could put Paul, possibly Paul, the apostle. But it reminds me, anytime we ask who wrote this book, uh, we should always remember it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit that moved uh, people, moved them by His Spirit, and, and really, He's the one that wrote it. And that's encouraging. It really is. Um, and we know, we, when we read it, we, we understand this was not written by man. Um, the ideas, the concepts, these are not man's ideas, man's concepts. This is godly things. And so, it's God's Word, um, ultimately, and we'll talk a lot about that in, in this chapter. So, um, that's the who. Who wrote it? And what is this book about? I love this answer to this. Jesus is better. That's what this book is about. The book of Hebrews as a whole, it's, and we're going to really see that emphasized in every chapter. Jesus is supreme. He's, he's God, ultimately. But remember, it's, it's addressed to people that were raised in Jewish customs, raised... Um, with the Old Testament in mind. So there's a lot of Old Testament quotes. A lot of, uh, He pulls back to the Old Testament quite a bit. But um, the ultimately, Jesus is better. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Um, where was this book written? Uh, we can only kind of speculate by the end of the book. Uh, chapter 13, verse 24 it hints that it, it, um, those in Italy send their greeting. And so it's very possible that this book was written in Italy, if not uh, around the area or region of Italy. So um, that's the where. 
When was this book written? Anytime between uh, 64 and 69 AD. Um, because the authorship is kind of unknown, that is, we don't know for sure if it was Paul the Apostle, um, the time is also kind of a broad uh, spectrum there, AD 64 to AD 69. We know for sure it was written before that infamous year that we should all be familiar with, 70 AD. What happened in 70 AD? The temple was destroyed. And so, the, and we'll, we'll see how um, this was written, and it's pretty obvious it had to have been written before that happened, before the temple was gone and destroyed. Um, so that's the when, who, what, where, when, why is this book so important? Well, we kind of already emphasized Jesus is better, but it really shows us how it's, it's all about Jesus. Um, Hebrews kind of sets apart, it's, it's set apart from some other books in the New Testament in really hammering that point home. That the Old Testament in particular is all about Jesus. So everything from the priesthood, the, the uh, sacrifices, and he gets into all that. It's all about Jesus. So that's why it's so important. Um, and then how... Uh, how the book can be um, kind of divided up is chapters 1 through 10, almost all of chapter 10, <laughs> but chapters 1 through 10, verse 18, is the superiority of Jesus Christ. So, uh, and we mentioned that, that, much of the book is about that. But then uh, 10, verse 19 to verse 13, it gets a little more practical, so the, you know, it's two, it's divided up in two sections. Chapters 1 through 10, verse 18 is superiority of Jesus Christ, and chapters 10, verse 19 through the end of the book, 13, um, is the importance of faith, and it does get into application, which again is a lot like Paul's style. Um, he just always starts with the doctrinal things, you know, starts with the superiority of Jesus Christ, and then he's going to end the book with how this looks practically in, in us stepping out in faith and, and uh, even pointing to the heroes of faith. But that's chapters 10 through 13. So, um, this book was, was really, and, and really emphasizes, there's just a side note here, emphasizes and actually stirs up a hunger to know more about prophecy. Um, to really get into the pro the, what the prophecies were, especially concerning Jesus Christ. I don't think I was as interested in what Old Testament scriptures spoke of Jesus Christ until I really read the book of Hebrews. And that's just a personal note. If anything you can take away from it, it will stir you up to find those Old Testament scriptures that speak of Him and that point to Him and that really emphasize, again, it's all about Jesus. So, <clears throat> that's the who, what, where, when, why, and how of this book. Um, now, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll get into our study. Thought I'd never get there, huh? God who at sundry times and in diverse man manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. And he has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better, there's a key phrase there for the book, he's so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a much more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said God at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So, um, this first section, first chunk, <laughs> one through seven, and there's a lot in this, um, lets us know, and it's the reason the title of tonight's message is How God Speaks. And it's been asked, you know, some people even think they know, what language does God speak? <laughs> and some people will get really critical and really dogmatic about, well, it has to be Hebrew. That's what he speaks. <laughs> or if you're an Orthodox Jew, some even say it's Yiddish. <laughs> and some say it's, it's kind of this... Uh, um, and then if you're American, right? Uh, some say it's English. <laughs> or if you're Russian, it's Russian. <laughs> or if you're uh, Spanish, right? All of these different languages we could, we could look at, and there's kind of foolish arguments about what language does God speak. Um, and kind of an easy way to sum that up that I've heard is He speaks Sunish. S-O-N-I-S-H. <laughs> Sun-ish. And that's what we get here. He may have spake, spoken Hebrew to the prophets of old. And what Hebrews chapter 1 here is so powerful in is it does away with all of that. It puts all of that to bed because of that one word, better. We have a better way. In fact, when in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I show you a much more excellent way. This is the same idea. You know about the law, you know about the prophets, you know about, and he's going to get into later on in the book, uh, priesthood and all of that, the sacrifices. But this is a much more excellent, a much better way. And it is, it's Jesus Christ. Um, and so you can get hung up on all that. But <laughs> at diverse times and different ways, that's all that means. Um, and really, we should add to that, in his time, he spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. But these last days, um, and it should be highlighted again, we are living in the last days. We are, we've been living in the last days since Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church. And people kind of have a hard time with that, but really it's, it's true, and it, it's interesting how the Word of God will repeat that. And we just finished Timothy, uh, yeah, Second Timothy, and looking at the last days. In the last days, these things are going to take place. And we can look around and know, yeah, we're living in the last days. And God has not changed the way that He speaks. In fact, how God speaks, what does it say the rest of verse 2? He's spoken unto us by His Son. Also, there's nothing to be added to what we have as far as the written words that Jesus spoke in the Bible. You might note that. It's spoken, not speaks. <laughs> he has spoken. It's a done deal. Jesus came. He lived a perfect life, right? He died and He rose again and He's ascended on high. People don't need to hear special revelation from Jesus Christ. It's in the Word of God, recorded, and we have everything we need for it. Yeah. Now, there's the, the rare case where somebody's out in the jungle, they don't know how to read, they don't know all this, and Jesus will appear. We've heard those stories. And He, he basically reveals Himself. But as far as you and I, and those who have the Word of God, we have everything we need for life, for godliness, wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. He has, in these last days, spoken by His Son. And there's no one greater than His Son. That's, that's kind of a way to sum up um, 
He has appointed him heir of all things, and he has made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. And I don't know how the cults and those that don't see, well, I don't know how the Jews of today don't see that the deity of Jesus Christ, they never read the book of Hebrews, sadly, tragically. Because if you read this book, you can't walk away from it, honestly reading it and understanding with the understanding that the author has of all of the Old Testament scriptures, which he brought up quite a few here in Psalms. Psalm 2 is actually what he quotes uh, where he talks about verse 5 there. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff when we really stop and think. Um, verse 2 uh, reaches, reaches back to Psalm 2 as well. Um, let's flip over to Psalm 2, shall we? <laughs> Be familiar with it. You cannot read Psalm chapter 2 and make sense of it without Jesus Christ. It's interesting. And we won't read the whole psalm, although it's short. <laughs> um, just the first few verses here of Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage, or the nations rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers uh, take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me. Now here it is. Psalm 2 verse 7. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Is he speaking about David? No. <laughs> it's, it's in that moment he's speaking through David, but it's pointing forward to a greater, much greater than David. Jesus Christ, the only begotten son. And so again, this is just an intro. This is just getting us familiar with some of these scriptures that are in the Psalms. And like I said, it's really hard to read those things and make sense of those things unless you have Jesus Christ. Unless Jesus comes along and makes sense of all of it. Especially when you get to the part where your king, uh, your kingdom and your throne will be established forever. Question, was David's throne established forever? No, it ended. It's not inhabited today. That is yet to be fulfilled. It's an exciting thing because we know that's a promise of God. It's called the, the Davidic covenant, the, the promise made to David. And one of the titles for Jesus Christ is the son of David. And so his king is established forever. It's yet to come. That throne will be inhabited by Jesus Christ. And so, um, powerful things when you really get into this. And, and you learn how to combat, if you will, or, uh, well, like the scripture tells us, to give everyone an answer for the faith that lies within us. If someone's questioning it, looking at Psalm chapter 2 and, and refuting, you have Hebrews as a companion to help you with not just Psalm chapter 2, but with any of those Old Testament scriptures that might get you scratching your head or others questioning about it. Um, but, back to verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1. He is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power. One of the names for Jesus Christ is the Word. And the express image of Him 
is the Word. Now, it's, it's much more when God was here, when Jesus walked the earth and spoke, the glory was all around it. And we have it recorded, and we get glimpses, don't we, of the glory. We get glimpses of the majesty of God just from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John reading the words of Jesus of the Word, <laughs> Jesus Christ. He is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. But that, it don't get any brighter than that. <laughs> Until you see Him face to face, this is the glimpse that we get. It's, it's in His Word. And of course, He by himself purged our sins. That's an important note there near the end of verse 3. By himself he purged our sins. No help needed. That's the strength of our Savior. That's the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. People come along. Cults will come along. Religions come along. And they, they try and teach and say, no, it's not enough. That, that the finished work of the cross was just a starting point. <laughs> no, it's the point, isn't it? The whole point of all of it. It really is. There's no other, you know, uh, there's nothing we can add to it. It will only ruin it. And when religions, when, when cults try and do that kind of thing, whether it's baptism, speaking in tongues, whatever it might be, wearing the right kind of underwear. And yeah, we chuckle, but it's true. People actually do that, thinking this is going to make me holy. This is going to make me more like Him and, and be closer to God. If I, and, and everything from, from outward appearances, wearing robes, dietary laws. People get obsessed over those kinds of things, thinking... Somehow, that's going to make them more uh, accepted or more righteous in some way. And you should always go back to Isaiah. Uh, I don't know if I can remember it. Isaiah 64. Don't write it down. <laughs> but you all know the verse, I hope. Yeah, Isaiah 64, verse 6. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. And our sins are like the wind and have taken us away. Away where? Away from Him. The whole point of Isaiah is, and the call on Isaiah was to point out how sin separates you from a holy God. Sin ultimately is the reason and what's so sad is those religious things and those, those uh, adding to the, the finished work of the cross is exactly that. It's sin. It does not, again, that's a huge thing. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, He purged our sins all by Himself, no help needed, totally sufficient, totally, and then He sat down at the right hand of God. It's awesome. There's a point where Stephen in the old in the uh, New Testament, you know, Acts chapter seven, Stephen is the first one that's beaten and and killed, martyred, martyred for his faith in Christ. In fact, the word witness we throw that word around all the time. Oh, I want to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Do you know that word means martyr? It's where we get it. And to be a witness, you were put to death. Especially back then. And the only time we see Jesus standing, because every other time, like here, He's sitting down at the right hand, but He stands up as Stephen comes home. It says there at the end of Acts chapter 7 he, that Jesus is standing next. Uh, Stephen sees the Son of Man standing next to God at the right hand of God. So, maybe He will when we come, right? <laughs> maybe He does that for all His children when they, when they come home. But, kind of a neat picture there. Um, and then He kind of, we read it already, but He kind of turns, 
he talks about the brightness of his image, his word, how, how incredible, you know, just God speaking through his son, Jesus Christ. But then he makes it even, he would, he would cause even more uh, dissension. He would cause even more controversy by saying to rabbis, by saying to Hebrew people, Jews, that he is made so much better, verse 4 says, than the angels. See, Hebrews and the Jews see angels so much differently, way differently than we do. That is God's ministering spirits. In fact, the law, did you know that Stephen tells us, actually, Acts chapter 7, somewhere in there, he talks about Moses writing the law by angels. God used angels. We don't think about that. We think about the stone tablet. God had the finger of God, you know, writing it. No, he used angels. And somehow it's a mystery. We don't understand it completely, but angels were involved in the law, in the giving of the law. So you would see how Hebrews, Jewish scholars, and the uh, rabbis would look at angels as no way. Nobody comes close to angels. And so Jesus is better than the angels? Angels are still a mystery to a lot of us. How many of you believe that there's angels? How many of you believe there's fallen angels? How many of you believe that there's demons? How many of you believe that fallen angels are demons? Careful. There's no scripture... There's no scripture to back up that fallen angels are demons. We just kind of insert that in different places. There does seem to be a little bit of differences between fallen angels. Fallen angels seem to be chained up for a reserved time and, and they're held where demons just seem to kind of roam all over and they possess people and they did in Jesus' time and... Um, so there's this mystery that's really involved with angels and things, you know, and of course people get way out in left field because the scriptures don't have a whole lot to say about angels, fallen angels, demons. As far as what we can tell, we just kind of insert things. I don't know where in the world we get chubby little babies with wings, that whole idea from, but <laughs> nowhere in scripture is that anywhere. In fact, quite the opposite. You have warrior, these warrior-like creatures that are meant for military forces. That's what angels are, especially when you get to Ezekiel and the, some of the books and the prophets. Um, and the throne room of God in Revelation. You have just these really kind of strange, in our sight, they would just be totally strange. And it is Strange to try and de depict it somehow. Um, so, but he, it's so awesome because he's, he's scratched that off the list. However much you can go, know about angels, however much you might study or get close to an angel, Jesus is what? Better. So who do you want to get close to? Ask Joseph Smith. Who do you want to get close to? You don't want some angel showing you something. You want it to be Jesus Christ. Right? There's so much you can see where angels really can be bad news when they're... And you see, well, there's, we don't know. The, the fallen angels, the demon, that, that whole thing. It's a mystery. And God alone knows that stuff. Thank God. Thank God. Well, thank Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. So, he's, he's given a much, a, a more excellent name than they. And, the, and again, the rabbis had Gabriel, they have Michael, they, they hold up some of these names, and sadly they do it higher than Jesus in some cases. And as I mentioned, the law, you know, that's the big thing. Um, I wish I wrote down that in Acts chapter 7. Stephen brings that out, that the law was given uh, through, through the help of angels. And so they, they hold to these things pretty powerfully, pretty tightly. And so, and then of course he gets into what we mentioned about Psalm 2. 
Which of the angels at any time did God say, you're my beloved son? In fact, Jesus only said that to Jesus, to, well, to David, through David, but we, we talked about how he couldn't mean David. It was pointing to Jesus. But then, of course, we think of his baptism when Jesus was here, being baptized from the heavens. He, he heard these same words. This is my beloved son. At the transfiguration, there on the mountain, John chapter 17, I think it is. And, and God speaks again. Moses is there, Elijah's there, right? And God says, this is my son. Hear him. Don't get uh, caught up in the law. Don't get caught up in the prophets. Moses would represent the law. Elijah would represent the prophets. Just, it's all in him. It's all Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And that first begotten in the world, that would also cause, and it should, if you do a little more research on the firstborn, um, there's a lot that could be said there. <laughs> but God goes out of his way, it seems, to make the firstborn be almost kind of shameful. Reuben, the firstborn of the twelve. <laughs> what a shame. In fact, missed out. It went to Judah. And of course, Jesus Christ comes from the line of Judah. And so, um, and that's just one of many, many accounts where, where God just seems to, to say, you know, humans mess up. But I have a firstborn of all creation, from all creation. That's Jesus Christ. That's what's being referred to. The firstborn, the first begotten into the world. Um, and the end of verse 6 is huge because... Only Jesus, the angels are actually commanded to worship Him. That's pretty powerful. Because we see that in the Old Testament. People fall down. In fact, in the New Testament, in Revelation, John falls down at an angel's feet. And the angel says, hey, hey, don't worship me. In fact, I'm commanded to worship Jesus. So let me get down right next to you and I'll, I will worship Jesus. I'm commanded to. So let all the angels of God worship Jesus. That's what the end of verse <coughs> 6 is, is referring to. Um, yeah, and, and we, we see that this is God's will. We see that this is God's message to all of us is that we worship Jesus. But unto the Son, now verse 8 goes on, but unto the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is, a, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, thy brethren. And really, it's above everyone. This is God, the anointed one. This is Jesus Christ, his anointed one. Verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish, but thou remains. And they shall all wax old, as does a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And we do see that the angels, and if you read chapter 1, you can kind of start to think negatively of angels, thinking somehow, well, Jesus is better, what's the need? You know, who needs angels then? And, and that, that's why it's important that you take the whole thing in context and see angels are ministering spirits 
In fact, Jesus needed angels to come and minister to him, albeit when he was a man. There's a mystery, another mystery that the Jews to this day have a real hard time with. How can Jesus be better than the angel? Well, if they ever read the book of Hebrews, they'd be asking these kind of things. How can Jesus be better than the angels when man is a little lower than the angels? And Jesus was a man. And so it is. It's a mystery. It's, it causes, it, they would say, that's a contradiction. And we say, Jesus is God, though. <laughs> and we've been given that revelation, right? We've, we've come to understand that. But just, just so you know, in the mind of the Hebrew, that's what they're having a hard time wrestling with. And even beyond that, Jesus died. Angels, as far as we know, don't die. So how in the world is Jesus better than angels? Well, the story's not over. He rose again and did something that no other angel could do, and that is defeat death. Totally defeated for all humankind. Angels, in a way, are a little selfish. None of them even thought for humankind. Jesus went and totally showed everyone what it means to put others before yourself. Angels, it's interesting, they seem to even have a choice because angels chose to, to follow Lucifer and became fallen angels. So it's, it, there's kind of this interesting connection with, with angels and even humans. In fact, angels come in the form of man. That's in the Old Testament. <laughs> the man shows up and wrestles with Jacob all through the night. That was an angel. We believe it was Jesus Christ himself. Another total mystery. But it's the angel of the Lord that, that you, you read about in the Old Testament over and over, and it, it's a, the appearance of a man. When we get a little bit later in the book of Hebrews, we'll see that some entertain angels without even knowing it. Speaking of Christians, speaking of you and I. And it's in the context, it's talking about being hospitable, being giving and charitable towards those that you might not know. They might be dressed kind of weird or have rags on and smelly and all that kind of stuff. So angels, it's fascinating how much we can get into when it comes to angels. The bottom line is Jesus is better, is greater, and the angels themselves, as I mentioned, are commanded to worship God. The, the most powerful scripture we have to prove that Jesus is God, we just read, Hebrews 1.8. And it's a quote from Psalm 45. So if that's not already in your margin, Psalm 45, verse 6 is what that's quoting. And again, this is God speaking. It's not my idea that Jesus is God. It's God's Word. It's, it's, it was written about long ago in Psalm 45, verse 6. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thy throne, O God. And in the context, he was speaking to and, and about his son. Well, we, we learn that, don't we, from verse 8 back in Hebrews chapter 1. Unto the son, God said that. Because if you just read Psalm 45, verse 6, you go, Thy, you know, <laughs> God said to. Well, it just says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And it's, is God just speaking to Himself there? Is David just speaking to God through the Psalms? Well, yes, but God's using it in a mighty way to show us God actually confirming, if you will, that Jesus Christ is God. It's not... <laughs> And you, you, you have scripture after scripture that you could point to, but this one is held especially high when it comes to those um, who are caught up in the Old Testament. 
And also, I think it's worth noting, God alone loves righteousness and hates wickedness or iniquity. Hates sin. Note, note that in verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. We would all love to say that that's us too, but the fact of the matter is we love sin. We are, we, we sometimes will schedule our lives around it. We love it so much. We have a hard time loving righteousness. If I didn't love sin, well, it would be so much easier not to love sin if sin wasn't so attractive. And sin didn't feel so good. So, you know, when we read these things, sometimes we, we've read them so long and sometimes we forget. No, sin is attractive and we find ourselves loving it, <laughs> indulging in it. And God is just not that way. God is the, and that's what makes Him holy. That's what makes Him God, and I'm not. Neither are you either. You know, it's, it's God alone that loves righteousness and hates iniquity. And I pray with the, the uh, psalmist, I pray that my children would learn to hate sin. Because we live in a culture that will totally, uh, just completely scoff and completely think, well, you're, you're a total outcast if you don't listen to that kind of music. If you don't know the lyrics to some of these songs that people sing. If you don't, you know, laugh at those jokes that some of the people are telling. No, learn to hate sin. It's part of an attribute of God. And it's actually the beginning of what? Wisdom and knowledge and understanding is to hate sin. Fearing God is to hate sin. And that's, again, all in the Proverbs, right? <laughs> over and over. And it's amazing how He has anointed you and Jesus. He's, again, verse 9 and Verse 8 and 9 is all speaking about Jesus. He has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above everyone and everything else. We think, no, if I really want to be glad, I got to go to the uh, festival. I got to go to the party and I'll be super glad and happy. When in reality, no, when you hate that stuff, you're not miserable. You're not, you're not in a corner just kind of, you know, <laughs> kicking at the wall and, and hating life. It's actually the, the uh, secret <laughs> to happiness. And it's why Jesus had the oil of gladness. It's why he was above everyone else the happiest in the room. Because he truly loved righteousness and hated. That's so huge. That is such a huge thing. Well, and then you get back, you, verse 10 just pulls back to Genesis, right? <laughs> Thou Lord in the beginning. That's what Genesis means. In the beginning. <laughs> you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are of the, of the works of your hands. And we see that. We do see especially um, I'm forgetting which proverb it, it lays out Jesus at the right hand of, of God as a master craftsman doing, making the heavens and the earth. Proverbs 8 I think it is. Proverbs 8. Just laying it out that Jesus Christ made the heavens and the earth alongside his father. And even the heavens and the, and the earth will perish. The things we look at, the beautiful trees, the rivers, the forests, all of that stuff is, is just going to 
it's going to wax old as a garment. It's going to need changing. How many of you look around and say, yep, it needs a changing. Don't think that, you know, uh, electrical vehicles are going to clean it up. Don't think that recycling everything on the planet will clean it up. No, it will happen. It's going to come and it needs a change. It's, it's setting us up for the kingdom. It really is. It's, it's getting us in, and the bigger, you know, the, the, uh, the greater grasp you get of the book of Hebrews, the greater your joy and ex expectation for heaven becomes. Um, and of course, to which of the angels, he, he sums it all up by going back to the angels and really putting, it, putting them in their right place, their ministering spirits. No, none of the angels are, are, are told by the Father, you, your enemies, uh, I'm gonna, you're going to sit at my right hand until your enemies are your footstool. That is, you will have no enemies. The angels would love to hear that <laughs> because apparently it's always a, it's a battle. They're fighting the battle. Ask Elisha, who had his servant's eyes opened to see the battle that one day, right? We're surrounded, Master. We're surrounded. Lord, open his eyes. And he could see angels just ready to go to war. And so they would want to be told, hey, your enemies are going to be your footstool. You can sit here at my right hand. But only one is told that by God himself. Jesus Christ. And the... the uh, the last thing I want to leave it with is that um, that story of Narnia, the Chronicles of Narnia, that great, I always love it, I go back to it all the time, the lion and the witch in the wardrobe and, and uh, Prince Caspian and the, uh, all three of them, there's three of them out there. And I don't know why they didn't do the rest of them, 12 chairs, and, but <clears throat> this scene where Lucy has been away from Narnia for a long time and she comes back and she sees Aslan for the first time after not seeing him in a long time. And she says, Aslan, how you've grown. You're even bigger and mightier and stronger and more powerful. And, and Aslan's quick to say, no, no, Lucy, you have grown. And the more you grow, the bigger I will seem. And that is Jesus Christ, the Lion. That's the book of Hebrews, summed up. <laughs> and the more that we study the book of Hebrews, guess what we're going to find out? Jesus is so much greater, so much bigger than I thought he was. And the more you emphasize that, because that's what Hebrews will do, <laughs> emphasize that and hold it up, that's how we grow. And that's, that's a proof that you're growing. It's not, oh yeah, I know Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus is a cool guy. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is this, that, or the other. No, Jesus is what it's all about. That's why the enemy loves to just throw Jesus' name all over and wreck it and roll it through the dirt. And just, it's, it's sacrilege, you know, just... The enemy loves to do that. It's all over movies. It's all over uh, just everywhere. I don't blame young children at all when I, when I hear them, but I correct them. And we should, we should all correct them, especially our own. And, and Jesus is big. So much bigger, so much greater than any human can convey, can, can try and articulate. It doesn't matter how, sometimes the smarter they are, the harder time they have getting that across. <laughs> but I love it. Oh Lord, we, we thank you for your word this evening, Lord. Just how big and how powerful, how mighty you truly are, Lord. I pray that 
our study in the book of Hebrews would we would see that we would come to know that personally each of us Lord drawing closer to you that the cares of this world the things of this world would just fade away would just dim in light of your glory your grace and your just works Lord you are so mighty so powerful and we we thank you and praise you I pray that the sacrifice that you made, Lord, going to the cross on our behalf, I pray even as we sing these last few songs, we would meditate on that. And you would give us a vivid picture, Lord, of what you went through on the cross for us. That, again, you would become even more of a Savior to us personally. In Jesus' name, sing.